So in this talk, I'll, I'll be discussing a graduate research project uh, that was aimed at discovering optimal quantum values for the multi-level feedback uh, the Q CPU scheduling algorithm. This talk will be short, uh, so you can expect a longer break before the next talk. I'll first discuss the basics of several scheduling algorithms and then some of the implementation details for this project. Um, finally, I'll review the results drawn from the conclusions of the simulation. I'm going to briefly review the first come, first served, round robin, and multi level uh, Q CPU scheduling algorithms since they play an integral part in a multi level feedback queue. And then I'll go into more detail about the multi level feedback queue. Uh, the first come, first served scheduling algorithm is the simplest of all the scheduling algorithms. <clears throat> First come, first serve simply queues processes in the order that they arrive in the ready queue. Supposing three processes arrive with burst times of 24, 3, and 3, we can see that the overall uh, that the arrival order of the processes affects the overall waiting time. Arrive first, it will run to completion before the shorter processes P2 and P3 are executed. The average waiting time here is 17 um, uh, clocks, clock ticks. Imagine if we reordered these jobs so that the shortest job were to run first instead. P2 would execute first, then P3, with a waiting time of only three cycles. And finally, P1 would execute having only waited six cycles. The average waiting time works out to a mere three cycles. Uh, clearly, this waiting time is far su superior to using first come, first serve. The problem with this algorithm, though, is that it's pure fantasy, since we don't know how long a job will take until after it's been executed. Modifying first come, first serve to preempt long jobs with short ones also causes a second problem called starvation. Uh, so what if short jobs continue coming into the queue, constantly preempting P1? P1 would never execute, leaving it starved of processing time. And so enter round robin processor scheduling. In round robin scheduling, each incoming process is assigned a quantum of time for executing. After reaching the, uh, the end of its allotted time, the process is preempted and sent back to the ready queue. So imagine a group of children waiting in line to drink from a water fountain. In a first part come first served queue, each child waits his or her turn in the order they arrive and must wait for each child in front of them to satisfy their thirst. If we modified this example to be a round robin queue, each child would get a fixed amount of time to use the water fountain, say four seconds. After they've reached the four second limit at the water fountain, uh, they can either leave the queue if they are done, or if they are still thirsty, they, can, they must return to the back of the line and wait their turn for another round to quench their thirst. So let's return to our example processes from before. Here we set our quantum to four, granting each process four cycles to complete. P1 is like a really thirsty child, comparing it to our water fountain analogy. P1 is allowed to go first, but is stopped after four cycles in order to reduce the waiting times for P2 and P3. After P2 and P3 have had a, have a chance to use their allotted cycles, they return control, and P1 repeatedly requests additional time until it fulfills its thirst. Our average waiting time is now only seven cycles. This isn't as good as our shortest job first algorithm, where we moved uh, P1 to the end of our queue but it's a big improvement over first come first serve scheduling. Another approach is to provide multiple queues for scheduling. Uh, processes entering the ready queue can be separated based on the type of job. Once a job enters a queue, it will remain there until execution is completed. Each queue has its own scheduling algorithm, such as round robin or first come first serve. Here's an example with five queues. 
Each queue has absolute priority over lower priority queues. No process in the batch queue, for example, could run unless the queues for system processes, interactive processes, and interactive editing processes were all empty. If an interactive editing process entered the ready queue while a batch process was running, the batch process would be preempted. Finally, the multi-level feedback queue is very similar to a multi-level queue with one key difference. In a multi-level feedback queue, processes can move between queues. A multi-level feedback queue can be defined with as many or as, as few queues as are necessary. And which scheduling algorithm used for each queue depends on the implementation. The purpose of the multi-level feedback queue is to give preference to short jobs and I.O. bound jobs and to separate processes into categories based on their need for the processor. The idea is to separate jobs according to their CPU bursts. If a job uses too much CPU, it's moved to a lower priority queue. Also, a job that waits too long in a low priority queue may move up to a higher priority queue, and this prevents starvation. So let's use these the following three queues as an example. The queues are numbered from 0 to 2. Um, the scheduler first executes all processes in Q0. Only when Q0 is empty will it execute processes in Q1. Similarly, processes in Q2 will only be executed if Q0 and 1 are empty. Processes that arrive for Q0 will preempt a process for Q1. Uh, a process in Q2 will in turn be preempted by a process arriving for Q1. A process entering the ready queue is put in Q0. The process in Q0 is given a time quantum of 8 milliseconds. If it does not finish within this time, it is moved to the tail of Q1. If Q0 is empty, the process at the head of the queue of Q1 is given a quantum of 16 milliseconds. If our process does not complete, it is preempted and is put into Q2. Processes in Q2 are run on a first come, first serve basis, but are only run until, uh, when Q0 and 1 are empty. Now, the purpose of the following experiment was to study the effects of various quantum values for the queues in a multi-level feedback queue. In order to study the effects of different quantums, I first had to create a controlled environment that could be used to test multiple processes of various sizes and collect data related to CPU efficiency and optimization. I created a virtual machine which simulates bytecode execution using a simple execution loop. The bytecode was generated from assembly code using an assembler, assembler I had previously written. Um, the virtual machine used a simple risk instruction uh, set with up to three opcodes per instruction. The system clock was simplified so that each instruction was considered a single clock tick. I created a simple operating system which followed a five-state process model. Multiprocessing, I.O., semaphores, and shared memory were implemented using a small subset of the POSIX specification. I also implemented paging and a file system. Uh, I made a number of simplifications in the virtual machine implementation. Um, context switching. Um, was assigned a cost of a single clock tick. Uh, this clearly isn't accurate, but without this simplification, there was no way to measure the effect of context switching on throughput in the simulation. So for example, the throughput uh, shows a clear difference between a quantum of one clock cycle with many context switches and a quantum of 100 with fewer context switches. The process control block um, I stored in a high level uh, structure. Typically, this would be stored in memory, uh, but keeping it in a high level structure simplified the implementation. IO bursts were simula simulated with random sized blocks of instructions. 
Uh, so testing thousands of data points with manual IO interaction would have been very tedious. I mentioned earlier that the multi-level feedback queue uh, can be implemented with any number of queues and each queue with different scheduling algorithms. In this project, um, I used two round robin queues for the higher priority queues and one first come first served queue. This is the same configuration I used in my examples previously. Um, I, I performed stress test, uh, testing by modifying the quantums of the two round robin queues to test the limits of the environment. I monitored multiple data points during the stress testing. Um, each test uh, run executed 10 processes of random length and random burstiness against varying quantums. The, the data I collected was the throughput, uh, the average waiting time, average turnaround time, and average response time. Um, I collected about 2,400 data points. This is a graph of the average waiting time compared to the two quantum values in the first two queues. You'll notice that there's an inflection point here um, where the data switches from this triangula triangulated pattern on the left to a parabolic curve on the right. It's a little hard to see in three dimensions, but uh, you get the idea. Uh, this inflection point is where we switch from, from the first queue quantum being larger than the second queue on the left side, to the first Q quantum being smaller than the second Q quantum on the right side. Uh, the data clearly shows that the first Q should have a relatively small quantum value in order to dec decrease waiting time. The optimal set of quantums for waiting time is two for the first Q and 13 for the second Q, which is illustrated by the minimum point on the graph right here. You can see that the turnaround time mirrors the results of the average waiting time. Uh, that's because the turnaround time is measured by the burst time minus or plus the waiting time. Uh, while the data collected is different, the reflected pattern is the same. The quantum versus throughput data displays a, this steep decline on the left side, um, which, and, which illustrates the quantum size is getting smaller. And so, for example, the upper left corner here um, is the quantums 50 and 50. The peak in the upper right-hand corner is the smallest quantums of 2 and 2, which is obviously inefficient on both sides here. To minimize the throughput down here, uh, we would choose the quantums of 4 and 17 this position being the lowest throughput on the graph. The quantums recommended by the waiting time and turnaround time, 2 and 13 on the other hand, are relatively inefficient as far as throughput is concerned. The quantums 2 and 13 are about halfway up the, the, the right-hand curve here. Uh, this proves that while low quantum values may be efficient for waiting time, they can negatively impact throughput due to increase in context switching time. Hello, sure. David. Can I can I interrupt sure. you for a second? Um, sure. I, I've lost the part. Uh, the quantums you measure those are um, times, right? Banked mm -hmm. in time. Okay. So when you say like seventeen, that would be seventeen seconds, microseconds. What is uh, the unit of? The the quantum is a uh, is the number of executions allowed. By Execution. Right. The cycle the cycles right 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 and yeah, let okay, me go thanks. back for a second so for example when um I, up here in this upper left hand corner where i said the quantums were set to 50 and 50 um that means that each each queue is given uh the process in that queue is given 50 execution cycles before it has to um, release control to a next the next process in line in the queue and obviously this is inefficient up here and then having the quantum set to two and two was uh, uh, really low was also really inefficient uh, because each process only had 
uh, as far as throughput is concerned. And the reason for this is because of context switching. When uh, context switching is the time that it takes to switch between processes. Um, so when the quantums are very small, uh, the there is a lot of context switching time because each process is only given two executions before it must um, release control to the next process. And when the quantums are really big, there's low throughput, but um, but the uh, uh, I'm sorry, but the, there's low um, uh, context switching time, but there is high um, the, the the throughput is slower because the um, uh, because there's it's inefficient in switching uh, between processes. All right, so the, the uh, chart for quantums versus average response time uh, shows this simple curve. Um, this chart just illustrates the reality that uh, the response time relies heavily on our first quantum um, due to the process arriving relatively close together. Uh, response time is optimized when the first uh, quantum is as small as possible. So in summary, the data suggests the op optimal quantum value for the first round robin queue should be between two and four, and the optimal quantum for the second queue should be between 13 and 17. Uh, using different uh, random test data caused uh, these results to vary slightly, but overall most results fell within these ranges. Now, the interesting thing is that um, there were six total graduate students who created this same simulation, and we each came to roughly the same conclusions with the same quantums. Um, based, so based on this specific um, multi-level feedback queue with two uh, round robin queues and a first come first serve queue. And then I have some citations here, and then that's it. Um, Thanks. Any questions? Hi. Uh, was Tim here? Uh, can you go back to the throughput slide? You want to see the throughput? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said that uh, the high points are bad. Isn't it actually that they are good because the throughput is larger. Well, we want we want to minimize throughput, um, uh, the really? the the average throughput time. So we want to in this case we want oh, to minimize the average throughput. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So it's the average um, throughput. So we want to minimize the time that it takes for all of the processes to complete. Is what that means. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, Aurelian, um, you you uh, have a comment in the chat. I'll just comment on that. Um, I don't remember the specific um, quantum values that the Linux kernel uses, but it does not. I'm pretty sure it does not use a multi-level feedback queue. Um, uh, the Linux kernel uses its own um, processing scheduling algorithm. I don't remember what it's called. Giovanni, um, I can't hear you. You seem to be muted. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, and I wanted to ask you um, what um, this is a, it's a very nice project you got to implement your operating system to simulate all this. It uh, sounds like a very, very nice uh, endeavor. And uh, what um, is this a purely theoretical uh, uh, exploration, or there are some exotic uh, or um, use case specific operating systems such as I don't know some real time operating system or some uh, I don't know uh, special uh, system that use this uh, scheduling algorithm and uh, um, if there is some um, some application be beyond the, the the theoretical investigation. This was purely theoretical, and it was just to um, uh, it was really just to investigate uh, the best uh, quantum values for. The multi-level feedback queue, and as somebody um, mentioned in the chat, it, it looks like uh, uh, 
the um, Linux kernel uses a single level queue. Uh, it doesn't use multi-level, which is interesting. I mean, uh, uh, the proposal is that my, maybe this would be more efficient for the Linux uh, kernel, but I, I, I didn't research that. Uh, hello, David. Uh, this is Michal. Uh, I'd like to ask about your test workload. You said that it was somehow randomly generated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, was uh, was the distribution somehow uniform? Or uh, then you mentioned that the other people did the same experiment. Did they use different uh, different distributions? Or uh, how, how, how are these workloads distributed? Um, we all created our own um, random distribution. Um, uh, uh, nobody did the same te uh, testing. Um, my testing was pretty um, intensive. I, I, I used quite a few data points and, and such. Um, some of the others didn't use uh, um, a lot of uh, data in their testing, but uh, there were a couple of other um, graduate students who used uh, similar that did similar testing to me, and we came to the same conclusions. And and for example, uh, we uh, our virtual machines were written in different uh, languages. I use C plus um, plus. Another engineer used Java, and so <laughs> obviously running on top of the Java virtual machine, and and I, th there's going to be um, some difference in timings and such. But but they still came to a similar conclusion with the. Uh, uh, as far as quantums and are concerned. Any other questions? Looks like well, Aurelian had some questions. I see uh, Aurelian is, oh, oh, I thought you were asking someone else, Aurelian. <laughs> uh, the, the source code for my project? Um, uh, no, it's not available, sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's an it's a um, uh, assignment f um, for a class. <laughs> and so um, if I posted the source code, then other students would cheat. <laughs> <laughs> but Aurelian, I can share the source code with you if you'd like, but privately. I'd be happy to open source if it if it didn't um, if it it didn't open up problems in the in the class with students cheating. 